you know, program, which is really a lot of fun because now we're going to get down to serious questions. Uh, Jack likes to uh, take the majority of the questions from the audience, but because we don't have the mics in the ceiling like we did last time, uh, I've collected questions from uh, a lot of the attendees. So when I call your name out and uh, ask the question, would you stand so Jack can address you and uh, respond to your question? Uh, the first question is from Victoria, and she said, Jack, we know that you're applying significant, significant effort on educating policymakers on prudent regulation of the fin financial industry. How can we help you? Victoria? There's Victoria. The political, are, you, are we there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the political system is such a mess, and, uh, and the, the, I don't know how to talk politics here, no, sorry. <laughs> but even, even I, special dispensation, <laughs> Even I have very little impact on it. You know, I can talk and talk and talk, and I sometimes I don't think anybody is listening. Uh, I have had a number of people interested in the, ret the retirement plan system, and uh, ha happily for me, I gave very extensive, this would also be on the website, very extensive analysis of what had to be done to fix it in my testimony before Congress. And this is like a probably 20 page paper, but of course when you go down to the Congress they want you to summarize it in two minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you do, and, and, and they were all fine, but nothing happens. So getting through the thicket down there is very difficult. I would say the best grassroots methodology you can use is to go to your local congressman, uh, write to your local congressman, visit, visit your local congressman if you can, and try and do it in the hope that all of us together can make a difference. It's a little bit, a little bit like people saying uh, they're not going to vote anymore because their vote doesn't count. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. And uh, that's a, if everybody observed that rule, we would have an even, <laughs> even more chaos than we have now in our democracy. But the fact is, we're in a, in a testing time where the issues of which I speak are not particularly interesting to interested interesting to anybody in Washington. I have talked to a couple of guys on the lower, lower guys on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, I, I did talk a little bit to Jared Bernstein, who was Vice President um, Biden's uh, economic policy guy, and fairly high up in the economic policy circles in the White House, but now he's left to do something else. Uh, so I, mean, I think it's just, just speaking out and, uh, and, and being totally prepared to say it had to be, to be ignored. I mean, I think if we're at a time, like those kids up on Wall Street, uh, where the mere fact of protesting at least gets in the papers, and politicians will often listen to the papers more than they listen to anybody else, because that's what they think everybody's going to, uh, you know, be basing their decisions on. So it's, uh, it's hard to help, but it's hard for me even to help myself. So that's the best I can do with advice. Jack, the next question is from Mel Turner. Mel's, would you stand so Jack can address you? What will be the regulatory response if money market uh, funds break the buck? Well, we have a, a, a really difficult issue uh, in money market funds. Uh, they're still, as I understand it, have that treasury guarantee of a couple of years ago. And uh, so there's obviously policymakers are worried about what would happen. Uh, there is going to be more regulation of money market funds. And I, I just don't see that it's even remotely possible that we will keep the same structure that we have now. Uh, you know, it, when you have free market capitalism, you know, people can do a lot of things. I mean, not all rating services are created equal. Uh, you buy one bad bond and uh, one bad money market instrument, uh, a commercial paper, as a, as a reserve fund did, and they're gone. <coughs> wiped off the face of the earth, first mutual fund. And uh, they're paying the penalty. This is one of the not really a problem anymore, uh, but uh, their mistake, as I would explain it to people, is they wanted to be the highest yielding institutional money market fund. Mm -hmm. And it's the easiest thing in the world to do when you look at the math. One, you can slash your costs. Two, you can slash your quality. Mm -hmm. Guess which the manager did? <laughs> and that's what cost him. He wasn't about to cut his revenues. And so there's a fundamental conflict of interest in that area. Uh, and, and if we're going to be bailed out by the government or have this Treasury guarantee continue, we're going to have to pay for that. 
And uh, I had an idea many, many, many years ago, probably in the mid-80s, that we should start an insured money market fund. But the cost of private insurance was like 75 basis points. We started, actually. We started it. Uh, it was the first and only insured money market fund. And it didn't work uh, because the you know, commercial portfolio, that 75 basis point insurance cost, made the commercial portfolio yield less than the treasury portfolio. <laughs> I mean, you know, the mathematics are all important here. And uh, so that was the one. But I, you know, everybody says it will be the end of the industry as we know it if we go to a floating asset value. Uh, you know, that may be. I said we have some people in Vanguard working on this and who sit right near me in the office there, the legal department. And uh, I stopped into one office. I said, you know, they're trying to protect the current present system as anybody who's in the system now would do. And uh, I said, you know, you've really got your work cut out for you because you look at the Wall Street Journal and uh, the Federal Reserve is against you. <laughs> and, that, and Paul Hoker is against you. And uh, I don't want to fight those two. <laughs> I mean, they're too powerful. And so a lot of very intelligent people uh, say the system has to change. And I would say the system will be changed. And uh, I don't see what's so bad about a floating asset value. And I can see it not as attractive to investors. But with our tax statements that we do, uh, you know, I, I do most of my short-term investing in limited-term muni, and uh, so I get a tax statement every year, and I either have a, you know, 275, this is a big account, $275 of <coughs> short-term gains, and you know, $111 of long-term gains or losses, whatever the case may be, and uh, it's very easy to take care of the tax thing. We have systems that take care of that. And so I don't see, I mean, I know it's not attractive from a marketing standpoint, but at some point, we have to say we're in the investment business and not in the marketing business. And that's a discipline that's going to be very difficult to voice in this industry. So I think change is coming. And, uh, and, and money market funds, almost certainly, by the way, I don't know if you're following this, will be designated, oh, they've got some initials, uh, economic, nationally uh, risk, nationally important to our financial system, and, and then this new committee that the Treasury and the, and the Federal Reserve are, are part of uh, is, is going to come into play. Significant financial institutions have to be, yeah, I'm sorry, significant financial institutions have to be uh, have certain controls, and that would be tough controls. So I'd look for change, but I would look for change as being a positive. Um, you know, it won't seem like that to the managers, but it, would, and it won't seem like that to the investors. Of course, with yields where they are now, I think I use a tenth of one percent doesn't really matter what you do. An awful lot of people are waiving their fees. And so they even have a tenth of 1%. I mean, the yields are just terrible. And we're all required to have, I think it's 40%. Don't hold me to this because I'm not into the detail. But 40% in treasury, short treasuries anyway, 30 or 40%. So um, it, it's, um, I'm not worried about money markets going down. I think the industry is worried. And the ICI represents managers and not shareholders. Uh, is uh, going to fight until their last breath keep the system the way it is, but I don't think the system is sound the way it is, to be honest. Okay, this question is from Dan Smith. Uh, he asks, what do you think of uh, Lewis Brown's book, The House of the Vogel Bill? <laughs> You're among friends, Jack. You can speak. That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I am read. And uh, we did as kind of a check. I did ask Kevin to read it. He did read it, and uh, he said I would like a lot of it and would hate a lot of it. I guess that's okay. And I think he, I think he did find some egregious errors in there, which were eliminated in the final draft. Uh, but uh, he, he, he couldn't get him to change the tone. I think many of the commentators, many of you, some of you are here in the room, by the way. It's an interesting kind of book because I check it on Amazon periodically, every other month or something. And he has these glowing five-star reviews from everybody. Uh, everybody loved the book, uh, which I guess is nice. And, and but the, the uh, it's selling, you know, basically nothing. It would make you know, any, anything I wrote seem like going with the wind or something. <laughs> but, uh, it apparently has a cynical tone to it, which is okay, and a lot to be cynical about in life in Vanguard and Vogel. And, but I think the thing most people have observed, those readers, and Kevin mentioned this too, uh, he just doesn't have any credibility 
when he talks about the future of Vanguard and the future of indexing, in saying new forms of ind indexing are going to supplant the old. I mean, I don't know what his standing is for making that kind of a statement. He doesn't know anything about it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's obviously, it must be obvious to you all, it's simply not possible uh, for new ways of indexing to supplant the old. Maybe for a minute, maybe for an hour, maybe for five years. But in the long run, the idea is to have a return that captures the market return. And the market is valued in dollars. And uh, so if you match it like we do in the S&P and, and to a lesser extent, or to a greater extent, the total stock market, uh, that's the only guarantee out there. And in some, of, some of the ETFs that I mentioned uh, that uh, have done, you know, proclaimed to be much better, have proved not to be much better, because how could they? I mean, when you, when you look at the portfolios, they all own pretty much the same stocks. Uh, and. Uh, it's just different weightings. So there are never, never going to be huge variations, although the Arnon Fund, as I mentioned, is so much more volatile. So, you know, the guy had fun writing the book. I like the picture on the cover. I did get that far. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I will probably look at it at some point. And my brother said they said, quoted him as saying some things. He didn't say they didn't see it and say him. But uh, apparently, a lot of kind of nasty stuff. And that's okay. I mean, there's a lot of nastiness in life. Uh, so, what, what else can I say? It will come and go, and uh, the idea that I would be dwelling on it in some horrifying, wonderful way. Well, I'm protected by that by, by not reading it. But uh, <laughs> the main reason I didn't read it was honestly, when Kevin told me about it, uh, when someone called up and said, press or something, said, which they never did, uh, what do you think of it, this and that? And I could say, sorry, pal, I haven't read it. it was kind of <laughs> stuff. So it will come and go, and it will be part of history, I guess. And a number of people have observed to me that first book was much better. And the idea, by the way, I want to be very, very clear on this. I had nothing to do with sponsoring the thing. McGraw-Hill came to me and said, would I cooperate and talk to this writer? And I said, sure. Because the first book, called John Bogle and the Zancar Experiment, ended 50, 50, 15 years ago. And I thought they were going to keep that and then add what happened in the last 15 years. But they went quite a bit beyond that. And I know there's some repetition uh, of that earlier book. And that was a nice, friendly book, mostly. So we have what we have. And how many of you read it? How about that? Well, that proves what I said about not shooting the lights out. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't read it, who's going to read it? <laughs> I think what happened, Jack, is uh, uh, some of the early readers uh, did some reviews on the uh, forum, and it didn't sound too flattering. So I think that turned uh, a lot of people off. So the next question uh, is from Joe Dugan. Uh, you've touched on this uh, a number of times before, but he'd like an answer. How important is an international holding in the stock portion of a portfolio? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I talked about that at some length. You, you, you're saying, first look, what is it? What is an international? You know, I'll just repeat my views, and not, not repeat from the speech because I didn't use it there. But my skepticism about international, my, my idea that international will not add a huge amount of value to you is based on, uh, first, the financial markets are great arbitrage, and a great way to arbitrage between the present and the future. So if emerging markets are going to grow much faster in America, that's not going to be news to the people that own Brazil and China and Russia and South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, it's in the price. Everything is in the price. So that's number one. It's, it's hard for me to see it will be totally different in return. And if it produces, say, a return of, let me say, 3% a year, which would be huge, in the next decade over U.S., and you have 20% of your money, and that's six-tenths of 1%. Well, there's so many better ways to save six-tenths of 1%, including buying Vanguard funds instead of somebody else's, and where the, where it's a guaranteed six-tenths of 1% and, and not a speculative. So um, that's number one. Uh, number two is when things are hot. Well, uh, number two really is, I should put this number one. America is an international nation. 50% is the number I always use. 50% of the revenues of the companies in the S&P 500, and presumably in the companies com comprise the total stock market, uh, are in out get revenues and profits. 50% of the revenues, 50% of the profits, come from, from outside the U.S. So you're already 50-50. Do you need to make that higher? I leave that to you. Uh, it used to be said that um, the big value was, that the, and I mentioned this slightly briefly before, the big value was 
that it diversifies because foreign markets don't react in the same way to things that U.S. markets do. And that's no longer true. It will probably be true again because these things revert to the mean back and forth and back and forth. Uh, next, when does international get popular? You know, these investment advisors will often say, well, you need this as an additional diversification. But they almost always look for additional diversification in the things that are the hottest. You know, no one's going to tell you to buy, I don't know, pork bellies uh, for them to diversify. And gold is the ultimate diversifier. It's the best diversifier you can possibly find. But people don't talk about, didn't, weren't talking about diversification 10 years ago by using gold. They're talking about it now. So it makes me, it makes me skeptical. And the same thing is true of international, although with a bad year for international. It'll be interesting to see, which I don't think we see yet, if money is going to go out of emerging market international funds back into the U.S. How the investors must be clearly disappointed. I think we had what a 25% drop in the emerging markets last year. In the U.S. market is almost unchanged now, uh, and, and that may be, by the way, the perfect time not to get out of it, not to get into it, but not to get out of it. Uh, so I, I don't have any easy answers to that. And I'm me, and you're you, and I would say you probably won't hurt yourself a lot if you use it modestly. I just don't see the point of uh, of having an international portfolio in which a which uh, the U.S. is about 40%. Uh, the the uh, in developed markets above broad are a little over 40%. And emerging markets a little under 20% in very round numbers. Uh, I, I don't think you need to go that far you know, to get 60% outside of the U.S. I mean, we earn our money in dollars. We pay our bills in dollars. We save in dollars. Uh, it's a dollar economy, and, and, and so to speculate on whether foreign currencies, which is a big part of the, of the uh, when, when emerging markets and, and developed markets are different, it's currency change and not fundamental value change, not local currency change. So I, I just don't think it's necessary. But if you said, you know, what's the matter with 20%, I would say nothing. Uh, I'd advise you not to go to 50%, mm -hmm. but I could be wrong. Uh, you know, it, I don't think it's going to be all that different. But I don't do it myself. I'm, I'm only about 20% in equities anyway. I, I, I thought at one point about getting into emerging markets, but, but uh, to confess totally, uh, and I'll, I'll say not only the thought about investing in emerging markets came to me, I thought maybe you want to do that. The idea of putting one or two percent in gold came to me. Uh, the idea of getting much more conservative uh, when I saw how far stocks would fall. I have the same temptations. Everybody does. See, as you say, the stock market. Why am I doing? What am I doing? Even with twenty percent stocks, and. Uh, the secret of my success, such as it may be, is I don't succumb to those temptations. <laughs> so I just I leave things alone. And the, the burden of proof for me is, uh, is actually making the change. Uh, you know, do you really want to do it? When do you want to do it? And that's a hard thing to do. I wouldn't want to scare anybody out of international. Um, you know, it, could be, it could be something I should be doing, trying to scare you out of it. But we don't know uh, the answer. So to make sure you're uh, widely diversified, Hang on to it. I wouldn't change your positions or else anything I can say or do. Uh, but just think about, and particularly that idea about, comp uh, about uh, the composition of the index. You know, it's remarkably concentrated in a very small number of countries. And you know, China is either the answer to our prayers for investing for the red, and this is Dr. Malkio's kind of point of view, uh, forever, uh, and uh, or maybe it's going to be the next great big collapse. And I'd say the odds of those two things happening are about 50-50. A lot of funny stuff goes on over there. Okay, the next question is from Sue, Lady Geek, uh, right here in the front. She says, do you think that a 4% safe withdrawal rate in retirement is a good objective? We're back to the Trinity study here. If a 4%, you know, we've, we've gone from an era where everybody thought 5% was right. Now, I've always thought 5% was too high, uh, because you know, when you think about the climate for market returns, you know, it's going to be something like 7% for stocks, I believe, and 3% for bonds, 3.5%. And, a half. and uh, you know, that, that's going to give you a portfolio return of, uh, well, I'll call it 5%. 4% uh, four four isn't safe, but I think you can do that in those circumstances change. Uh, I'd keep a little eye on, you know, whether you're consuming capital. And, and what you're doing, though, with that kind of a return is with the knowledge certain the purchasing power of your assets will be smaller 10, 20 years from now than they are today. Um, you 
you know, if we have inflation of 3%, and, you know, right now inflation is, I guess, 1% or something, and the bond market, and the inflation bonds tell us the inflation rate will be, even up to 30 years, will be 2%, and that may be right, but if it's right, we've got a lot of problems. Uh, this economy is not going to be growing uh, if, if we have 2%, uh, if we have 2%, only 2% inflation. So, um, you know, I, I'd stick with four. I mean, I, it's, it's too fine-tuned. I think three, three is a little bit lower than it needs to be. If I was to say, you know, three and a half would be better than four, I'd be talking through my hat. Good as usual. The next question is from Chester Skoropa. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, it's a three-part question. If you had a magic wand, what changes would you make to, number one, what is currently available to retail investors? Number two, how Vanguard is run. And number three, the overall investing atmosphere in the country. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking about the second one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know, I, this has become a product industry. And I banned the word product at Vanguard when I was running it. And you have to pay a $5 fine if you ever use such a word. <laughs> That's quite simple. We are not in the business, or should not be in the business of selling products. Uh, you know, that's somebody else's business. You know, whether it's Campbell Soup's business or Budweiser Beer's business. Uh, you know, make it and get rid of it. Uh, and, and that's not the business that, that, that is the, the core of what Vanguard should be about. The word has crept back in, and we use it all the time. Uh, it, it's a, I don't mean that in too critical a way, a little bit critical way, because there aren't a thousand other words. I mean, you say a financial service or a trust service, and it doesn't kind of, it seems a little complicated and cumbersome. So product is kind of a good word until you think about it. And uh, so I didn't like the, the idea it left, and uh, you know, it's just not a happy way to think about the business in which I find myself. Uh, so uh, I think, I think you said the first part of the question, what retail products or something uh, should we have to make available product for the retail investor. And I'd say, less, less. Why do we need more? Uh, you know, there are, I don't know, thousands of funds out there. Now, we, now we've reached totally the law of returns. It's absolutely like going to Starbucks in the morning and getting that iced latte with blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what it is. I mean, you, you hear water. It, it must be terribly expensive. And I, by the way, I only, I only drink Benny Bold. Benny means large, by the way, those of you who don't know. <laughs> and, uh, so I'd say less, and that's not going to happen. Uh, but the message I'm trying to send is don't complicate the job. Uh, you know, the first rule of shooting is don't shoot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what the second rule is? I don't think it's relevant here. I hope not. If you shoot somebody else, be sure you kill them. <laughs> At Vanguard, uh, you know, there's some things that can't be changed. Uh, we've gotten big, and I'm not a big company guy. I wouldn't go to work for a big company. And we have, by the way, the most incredibly dedicated people at Vanguard. Uh, they have a high respect for me, even as I'm in these waning, waning years of my life and career. Uh, they enjoy being with me. They ask me to come to their retirement parties, which I only do, religiously only do, if not if the management's not there. When I get one of these invitations, I say, I'll be glad to come and talk to you all if the coast is clear, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> they write back and say, I do know what you mean, yes, the coast is clear. <laughs> and and that's, that's not a cynical comment, I mean, I don't want to interfere with, you know, if the, if the management wants it. Can't, they can't do all these things when we have 12,000 people, so I'm happy to fill that gap, and our crew is, is certainly very happy to, to do it. Uh, let me give you an example I often talk about when, you know, you, when you talk to these crew members that I told you I did for an hour at a time. Usually we don't have a time limit, but sometimes it goes longer, but it seems about to uh, You know, you never, never, never been talking to one of these wonderful people. I've uh, often been there a long time and got the award for excellence for cooperation and excellence and, and working well with colleagues and all that. And uh, you never say, well, an hour is up, that's it. I mean, you just let it go until it kind of doesn't go anymore. Uh, but uh, we talk about the rise of bureaucracy, 
and I, I think I mentioned that line. I did mention that line. Is for God's sake, let's always keep a place, Vanguard, a place where process, judgment has at least a fighting chance to triumph over process. And I say, look, here's all process, uh, judgment, and here's all process. And the bigger you get, the more that line moves over. You know, when you get big, it's going to be here. Uh, say somewhere three quarters of the way across. There's no way around that. Although I do observe that if the, if the chief executive loves process, it's going to be over here. Mm -hmm. And if the chief executive hates process, it's going to be over here. But it's never going to be back here. And there's no way around that when you get big. That's one of the hazards uh, of you know companies growing. And of course, when you think of people like GE and God knows who else, about 200, 300 from Walmart, two or three hundred thousand employees or more, I guess. Uh, not bank are really isn't big at all. But uh, you know, we started, I couldn't, I couldn't help observing as I looked at your program today, but uh, it looks like we have around 30, I mean, I think it's a really great sign, by the way, some kind of arm's length stuff with Vanguard and Vogel heads for quite a while, and that seems to be all mended, fortunately, or mostly mended anyway. And uh, there are, I think, 30 Vanguard people are going to be around for the other day. And uh, you know, they're going to have these little, this little fair where you talk to people about ETFs or whatever else you want to talk to, and uh, talk about it, and then the participants in the panel, and then I guess a number of people to help you around from A to B. And uh, yeah, I couldn't help thinking when I looked, I didn't do an exact count, but I think 30 is about the right number. It occurred to me that when I started Vanguard, we had 28 crew members. <laughs> so you're going to see two more people than I saw. <laughs> Actually, three, because I didn't count myself. <laughs> so um, you, you get bigger, and they can't. I think Bill McNabb is a, tries to keep everything as, as personal as he can. But you have to do so much by video, which doesn't cut it for me. I, mean, I know they have to do it, uh, and I think we're very sensitive on the, on the flagship side uh, to you know, trying to maintain fairly easy to get your flagship representative on the phone. Very, very important thing, particularly now with Admiral's shares being so much important. I think I said 35%, 31%, I guess, of our business. And so you try and, try and fight it where you can. But uh, you know the, the key thing, the, the, the two key tasks, as I see it, for being are one, don't do anything stupid in the investment side. And you could argue about some of these things. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure about you would call market neutral. Uh, I'm not so sure about the way we're running target retirement. Uh, I haven't figured out what the heck managed payout is all about yet. <laughs> but, but give me a little time, I'm sure I will. And, and uh, but. That doesn't have to affect any Vanguard shareholder because you don't have to do the things. I, I do wonder a little bit, you know, the big tension in this business is, is always the tension between uh, management, professional management, and marketing. And uh, marketing is a terrible driver. When everybody else has some hot idea, uh, a lot of copy goes on. And uh, it's, you know, it's a strategy. It's a, you, know, you can argue it's a business necessity. And they still remember uh, that uh, my, my basic two rules of marketing, market share, which I talked a lot about at the beginning of my talk, uh, is a measure and not an objective. And market share must be earned and not bought. And I did, uh, I did mention the second of those rules when it came to my attention that we were thinking about buying Barclays ETF operation. Market share must be earned and not bought, pal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I could never figure out how that would work. I, I, I was not pleased that we were considering it, but I was ecstatic that we didn't do it. <laughs> no, I don't think it would have been. I don't know how you have high cost ETFs, the same platform as low cost ETFs. And if you, had, if you had to make the high cost, their high cost ETFs or our low cost ETFs, what are you buying the thing for? I mean, there go all their profits. And it's a very profitable business. For so uh, I, I don't really, I, mean, I think management is coping with uh, difficult circumstances of growth, uh, difficult circumstances of trying to be competitive. And I'm, you know, I'm the competitive guy. I mean, I like to slug everybody in the nose. Uh, and, uh, the, and I don't understand why anybody else is doing any business at all but Vanguard out there in the marketplace. But uh, it's, it's, I think they're handling that tension as well as they can. So I really don't think I can. This next question. Although I didn't get to the third one. What was the third one? The overall investing atmosphere in this country. Crazy. 
<laughs> it's, and I mentioned this in my talk, the triumph of speculation over investment. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, what I'm saying about the overall investment atmosphere is the question is, in effect, ill-chosen. Because we don't have an investment atmosphere in this country anymore. It's all speculation. What happens in the marketplace is 90% speculation, or even higher than 90%, believe it or not. People trading with each other uh, as if they were in a great big gambling casino with no gain to society and a loss to those investors who were doing the trading. <laughs> and, I mean, I'll give you the example that I usually use, and then let's assume that each stock in the Standard & Poor's Index, uh, half of each stock was owned by speculators and half was owned by investors. Uh, well, we know that the investors who don't trade at all as a group will capture the market return exactly. Uh, and we know that the speculators will also capture the market return, but by trading with each other, because there's no one else to trade with, they'll pay these croupiers and they'll end up with less than the market. So the idea of investing over speculation, the triumph of investing over speculation, what we have now, the triumph of speculation over investment, is a mathematical certainty, a mathematical certainty. And you know, I try to build a company out of mathematical certainty. Gross return minus cost equals net return. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's crazy. And then think about it this way. Uh, from the high in the market this year to the low, value of American businesses represented by the price of stocks dropped by $2 trillion, say from $16 trillion to $14 trillion. Does anybody really think that the value in that, I don't know, four-month period of American business dropped by $2 trillion? I mean, it's inconceivable. It was pretty much the same at the end of the period at the beginning. But market expectations, a big problem, and it created a, an environment for stock prices that was divorced from the value of The next thing is from one of your favorite bogleheads, Kathleen Ryan, who had to cancel. Uh, the question is at the beginning, but she has a, a, a note to you after that. Uh, the question is, uh, being you were born in 1929, did that influence you at all with regards to your study of investing in the stock market? She says, when my grandmother passed away at the age of 97 years and eight months, I went through her important papers and found a fractional stock warrant dated December 10, 1929. I felt that she was very courageous to invest in the stock market only about two months after the crash of 29. The fractional warrant was from Transamerica Company with a signature stamp from A.P. Giannini. <laughs> Giannini. Had I known, I would have asked her if she met him. I like to think she did. How cool is that? That if she had met him, she would have met the founder of Transamerica, and I, her granddaughter, had met the founder of Vanguard. <laughs> Two very big captains of industry. I mean, wow. With best wishes to you always, Captain. So the question is... Oh, being, uh, what were the questions? <laughs> <laughs> she put it at the beginning instead of the end. But being you were born in 1929, did that influence you at all with regards to your study of investing and the stock market? Well, first, uh, not to belabor the obvious, I was quite young in 1929. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the look in my father's eyes when he came home with the newspaper, and I knew some, there was some real trouble. <laughs> and, uh, but I was at that point six months old. Uh, the, I think in a sense, it's, it's a pretty good question, but, but it's not so much the 29, but the 30s, where my family had a nice amount of money for those days, and it all vanished at the Montclair Trust Company. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the banks were doing the same thing they were doing in the last big bust. Buying the things that were hot, and the buying probably leverage those Goldman Sachs leverage closed-end investment companies that actually all went bankrupt. Uh, and uh, that's Goldman Sachs for you. you. Change the script, but you can't change the outcome. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, going through a period, where I, knew, I knew nothing, I knew practically nothing about the stock market. You know, instead of getting like any anybody else. Uh, these wonderful confirmations about how much our 401k plan was worth. We were getting notices from the personal finance company saying, if you don't pay up, we're going to take over your house. <laughs> That's a little different environment. Hmm. Uh, so I remember the economic privation that came out of the boom and the bust uh, very, very well. And uh, it's made me a lot, a lot, made me the way I am. Uh, I don't like to spend money. I really do not like to spend money, period. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I don't buy anything for myself. 
almost nothing. I did buy a few new pair of khakis last summer. <laughs> 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 but I just don't enjoy that, and that, that comes out of your own brain. But it, in a lot of ways, your persona is shaped by uh, not having a lot of money, uh, knowing you have to earn what you get, and I'd call those really good things. You know, it's, it's an advantage in life. I was mentioning this <coughs> earlier that uh, one of you came up and chatted with me about leadership, I guess with Laura, and uh, I read those little things in the New York Times, and page two every Sunday, about leaders or purported leaders and uh, you know what their background is and what they look for in leadership. And some is pretty good and some is pretty horrifying. But uh, what, is, what is really uh, interesting is I think at least a third of them had been waiters when they were young. And I think waiting on table is probably the best training anybody could ever get. You know you, you, know you got to do it. And no matter how unhappy you may be, and I was never unhappy doing it, and you're serving somebody else. When I'm a poor kid at Princeton, and waiting on the rich kids in the dining hall, which is the way they used to do it. And I thought it was great. It's very democratic, uh, you know, very fair. And now we're more democratic, and I don't think that's very good. Uh, you know, I think if the kids that don't have money have to work to get it, well, you know, that's life. Uh, but I think you come out of it with a big advantage, a big advantage of knowing what it is to stand up for yourself, knowing how to take responsibility, and knowing that sometimes, no matter how difficult, circumstances are, you still have to smile, uh, and you can't get angry, and the customer or the client or the person you're serving dinner to is always right, and uh, I do remember dropping one of the biggest trays down Eagle, Lower Eagle Dining Hall, you know, you used to carry these trays like that, they probably had 12 plates, 12 butter plates, 12 saucers, 12 cups, I can still hear the noise. <laughs> question is from Dan Smith. Uh, it says, what's your opinion on the value of an Ivy League education? How important is it to go to Princeton instead of Rutgers? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me say this. As you can probably imagine, uh, a number of friends, classmates of mine from Princeton, and friends of mine here will ask me to interview their, their kids and write a letter to Princeton. And uh, I pretty much do them all, uh, you know, maybe for a year. I'm very clear about my recommendation. You know, the, I can't say I knew, I've known this kid all of his life or her life and seen him grow because I haven't. I say his father asked me to interview him, and here's what I find. I'm very clear about that. I don't want to do anything deceptive or duplicitous. It's not a good idea. Uh, and uh, I, I always say to the kids, you know, I know you want to get the odds are terrible. They're much worse than the posted odds. I mean, they claim to take 8% uh, of the applicants, and the, the real number, I'm sure, is like 4%. But you need to count a football player here or there, another kind of an athlete. You need a tuba two, two player. Uh, generous alumni I think they're entitled to some kind of a legacy, and they are. I mean, they, they, they get it, and I, I would argue they are, uh, but uh, that's another story. But you take that group out, uh, and the real admission rate is probably 4% or 3 Very crisp. And I say, you know, it's amazing how, I say to these young men and women, uh, it's amazing how many people I know who had enormously successful careers, happy families, fulfilling lives, uh, that never went to Princeton. Amazing. <laughs> uh, would I prefer Princeton to Rutgers? Yes. <laughs> but I, you know, it was just a great place for me. It was much preparatory. It's so different and diverse now. You know, we have a lot more, well, I think it's exactly half, or almost exactly half women. There were none, no women when I was there. There was a black young man in our class who we didn't even know was black. It was kind of, you know, not dark, but he was black. Uh, they had limits on Jewish kids, uh, and uh, there were very, very few Asians. And all that has changed. I mean, Princeton is adjusting to modern times. And, you know, I loved it the way it was when I was there, but I realize you can't great affection. It was a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. Uh, and, you know, if I hadn't gone to Princeton, there wouldn't be any Vanguard, right? And I wouldn't have written my senior thesis in the mutual fund industry because no other college in the country asked for the undergraduates to write a senior thesis. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a great blessing. I wouldn't take back a thing. I owe an awful lot. Uh, but
but uh, today, uh, you know, the, the world, you, you, talent will emerge, and I'm sure you can get a good, a good education at, at uh, Rutgers. I'm sure you can get a good ed education at Westchester University here. Uh, little, big, it ends up being up to you. And uh, you know, I'm a big believer uh, that we have ourselves to answer for finally. And the idea you don't get into Princeton, say, and spend the rest of your life complaining about how your future was ruined by not getting into Princeton, there is the perfect identity of a loser. <laughs> The next question, and there's a little inside uh, explanation for those who don't know. Jack really does have a slide rule on his desk, and he knows how to use it. So the next question is from Dan Smith, and he wants to know, what kind of slide rule do you use, Pickett and Eckel or Koffel and Iser? Which is best, and why do you use a slide rule instead of Excel? <laughs> the answer to the second part of the question is Koffel and Iser. Uh, and uh, it's aluminum. The wooden ones get very sticky, uh, and I also have a little mini one that doesn't work very well. I have three of them, so when I start banging on my desk to find one under all that paper, I can use one. <laughs> uh, and uh, they're really, I mean, everybody says it's kind of a joke, but I got into this a long, long time ago. I didn't use it. I wasn't an engineer or anything, which is where you see slide rules used mostly in undergraduate days mm -hmm. uh, and when I was in college. But uh, I was doing every... Um, at the end of every month, I would have to go over to our Camden office, where our funds were located as compared to the management company, and uh, get yields and everything in the portfolio. And uh, so that was the, what we did in those days. And, you know, I had my little Monroe calculator, you know, the kind of thing you crank. Well, I found out the yield on General Motors, say, was 6.48329 on my computer. Wonderful. What the hell do you do with that? <laughs> I found out by a quick switch of the slash of the slide rule, I got 6.4, and I didn't care about the 82419 or whatever it was. I mean, it's very, very efficient compared to what we were doing then. I don't use it as much now, but I don't think many days go by when I don't, when I don't do something with it. And uh, it's, it's because I'd rather be approximately right than precisely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this question is from the forum, Jack. It's uh, from Joel, and he asks, uh, Mr. Bogle, what, what are your top priority projects for the next one or two years? Thanks for what you've done for individual investors. Well, uh, my highest priority, and, and you know, the things keep getting, though, know, it's amazing how every day something new pops up. Uh, and uh, you'd think that the, the demand for my ideas, services, whatever, uh, would fade, uh, but they don't. And in, certain, in a certain way, I think I could make a statistical case without even the slide rule that they're actually intensifying. But <coughs> right now, it's, I, mean, I spent a lot of time on things like the talk I gave to the, to the uh, endowment fund officers in Washington. And I spent a lot of time doing this this morning, a little slapdash for me, but it doesn't, you know, you don't just say, well, let's throw together some charts, Mike, and, and say that to him at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. That's just not the way the system works. So all these things are diversions from what I really want to get away from, out of the way for my next priority, <coughs> is finishing the darn book. <coughs> the book, and I mentioned the deadline got that lengthened because of my disability, uh, or inability, as the case may be. And uh, so that's my first priority. And then I don't think I'm going to write a book anymore. Uh, I think that will be, really will be my last book. Uh, it's a lot of work, and it, it's, the, it's the overhang uh, of you know, having a task that has to be done when you're 82 years old, and uh, so uh, it'll be uh, it'll be done by my deadline at the end of February, and it'll be done well. Uh, I don't want to compromise on quality as well as I can do it, I should say. And I don't want to compromise on quality. And then there will be periodic speaking invitations. I'm doing very few between now and then. And I did get an invitation to speak in Lexington, Kentucky, in 2014. 2014? <laughs> I told him I was busy that day. <laughs> and I, I don't much like any more flying. You know, we, we grew up with getting there is half the fun. Getting there is not half the fun anymore. I guess that was the Cunard line slogan. Uh, travel doesn't really appeal to me, so I'm trying to limit my ambit where at all possible to uh, New York, Boston, which I can get to by train. Uh, easily, um, and uh, Philadelphia and Washington. 
So I have, you know, little speeches. The National Association of Business Economists down here is coming up. Uh, I'm going to do a seminar. I must say I was greatly complimented by this. I don't know how many of you follow Jim Grant, the interest rate observer guy, the best writer in this business, without any question. Uh, and he's a big forum every year. It's very prestigious. And he asked me to just do a Q&A with him this year. And uh, he really needed me, he said. So I took that as a great compliment. So I'll be, be up in New York, and I'll, I'll attend that whole thing, which probably starts at 8.30 in the morning and goes till 4 or 5 in the afternoon. But I'm interested in getting home at, at night, uh, getting home at dinner. So I'm going to leave you this afternoon, probably around 6.30. Uh, but I'll be there up until then. But I just want to see how our guys do. <clears throat> Get a chance to chat with you all a little bit. Uh, and uh, we'll chat a little bit. Time. But I, and, and then, you know, if you're going to do television interviews, and this is, you know, it's a ridiculous kind of discipline. But if you're going to do a, even a simple television interview with uh, an ignorant question, <laughs> uh, and they're, they're, not, they're not all ignorant, by the way. I didn't mean to suggest that, but it, it, it's been known to happen. And uh, you have to be prepared. So you end up trying every day to keep up with what's going on. And if you're interested in every single thing that is happening in the world, which means you're in the financial business, uh, you know, it's the New York Times, it's the Wall Street Journal. On Saturday morning, I can spend two and a half hours with those two newspapers. During the week, I do primary one on coming to work and one on going home, because uh, the company's still nice enough to have our mailroom guys take me back and forth. And uh, so just keeping up and being interested in everything. And then, after I get the book done, I was telling someone earlier, uh, I don't think a day goes by without some idea in my mind for an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, or an op-ed in the New York Times, or even the Financial Times. I got to, they want me to do something. They haven't even said what. Uh, but they come to me. I don't, I don't know exactly why. Maybe it's irreverence. Um, maybe it's age. Maybe it's wisdom. God alone knows. Uh, maybe it's because uh, they know I'm a pain in the duffel bag. Uh, but um, I could write an op-ed at least, I, I say, every day on, on a different subject. But I can't. Do it because it takes a day to write the darn thing. And uh, I'll tell you, maybe, can I just tell a, a, a funny kind of story? Sure. Take it. Uh, one, of, one of my most amusing was a, in the Wall Street Journal. And I get a little note from Tunku Bajanarian, the guy that ran the, uh, an Indian educated in Britain, who became that, that editor for the Times. And he was kind of an irreverent guy, and we got along pretty well. So uh, I wrote a lot of stuff for him, and the editorial guys over there really didn't like much of what I was writing, particularly when I wrote something nice about Elliot Spitzer. Uh, and, uh, but they would print, and he, and he would ask. So I, I get a note from him one day, and it says, don't you hate dot, 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 the title thing, and then dot, dot, dot in the next line, uh, Davos. Davos, where the World Economic Forum takes place every year. Oh. And I, so I write back and say, uh, it's absurd, ridiculous, and a waste of everybody's time except for the egos of all those big shots that go there. And so he writes back and says, can you give me 1,200 words on it? <laughs> <laughs> but since they're all in Europe, you've got to meet the deadline for the afternoon, for, uh, for the European edition. So it has to be done by 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so I write the thing. And uh, well, my granddaughter was coming in for lunch. And and believe me, I am not going to, uh, she is not going to be part of my, my type of time schedule. If you have a chance to have lunch with your granddaughter, don't let anything interfere with that, ever, 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 ever. So I got it typed up, uh, took her out to lunch, obviously at the cheap Vanguard cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> Came back, edited the thing, and had it all up at a quarter of three. And it was a really one of the most fun op-eds I've ever done, and probably the best one I've ever done. It was fresh, it was irreverent, uh, and uh, I complained about all these guys. And then I said, you know, I am, I am interested enough, the last line said something like this, I am interested enough uh, that when I read President Clinton is flying over to give the concluding address tomorrow, uh, if he calls me up and will take me, on, take me on his plane, darn if I won't go with him. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't call. <laughs> Tell you, 
I love when I look at chapters in the past books. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't dwell on them. But every once in a while, I look and see, see what I said. And I really love what I've written and how I've written it. And it's very egotistical, very self-serving, but I really do. And I think it's high quality writing, <laughs> very important issues. Uh, and uh, so I, but the first drafts are so pathetic that if I was your student and you were a teacher, you'd say, pal, you got no future <laughs> in engineer. <laughs> Just in a lot of ways of what I am anyway. Uh, this question is from, got there late. Uh, I know he's out there somewhere. Uh, do you have any regrets about your founding the Vanguard, and what would you do differently if you had it to do all over again? Well, there are two things I'd do differently, one of which I talk about and one of which I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, you know, I feel comfortable in saying, uh, you know, I, I kind of wish that I'd had a, a gentler, I mean, I'm, a, I'm basically fundamentally, I think, a gentle person. Um, but if you're trying to put a new company and new ideas in the map, you can be pretty darn abrupt. And I don't think anybody would tell you it was ever in a mean-spirited, put-down way. But things have to be done. And you can't convene a committee to do them. And I never did. You know, I, I, you try things in this life, and given my, my work ethic, which is superb or pathetic, depending on how you look at it, um, you know, I'm going to know more, just because it's the kind of person I am, not because I'm any smarter, I'm going to know more about the issues I want to talk about than anybody around that table. And I don't want to have other people who know less. If they know more than I do, I'm more than willing to, to help them. But they haven't thought about it, they haven't walked around it. It's a new exposure for them. This is not their fault, but, you know, we are who we are. And uh, so I was probably much, and I, I've confessed to this, much more of a dictator, uh, high-handed probably, but I think in a decent <coughs> way that people pretty much understood. Uh, and so you know, maybe I should have been, quoting George Bush the first, a kinder, gentler uh, executive, chief executive. Uh, but maybe there wouldn't be any vanguard if I were. So you got, you, you got to take the good and the bad. And uh, I, no one can really imagine what it was like in those early years to try and get stuff done. And, you know, you say, do it. And, or often, with a group of four or five people, I don't know who's going to do what. Would you guys figure that out? Here's what has to be done. And that was it. And I, I don't think that's a bad management style, actually. Uh, but I, I never thought about management style. And someone, Laura, I think, again, asked me about leadership. First rule is, for God's sake, be who you are, because people can spot a phony a thousand yards away. I don't think anybody has ever called me a phony. <laughs> How could they? Good. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is so terrible, they don't need to. 